is there a God? You know, virtually every person in the world has asked this question. Some people say there is no such thing as God. Others are firmly convinced He exists, and some people, they don't really seem to know, and they don't really seem to care. Is there a God? Have you asked this question? Let's explore the answer. As humans, we've learned that in our material universe, every effect must have a cause which is greater than it. Buildings don't fall without a cause. Planets don't spontaneously pop into the heavens. And universes don't just appear out of the blue without a cause. You see, our universe as a whole is a material effect. Therefore, even it has to have a cause. But we know that our universe couldn't have caused itself, and we know that our universe isn't eternal. Therefore, it must have had a cause that is not material or natural. Thus, our universe must have a supernatural cause. But why would a person say God is that cause? Well, when we look into the universe, we see that it's huge. Astronomers tell us that it contains over 100 billion galaxies. And in each of those galaxies, there are hundreds of billions of stars, sometimes even trillions. The cause for such a vast universe has to be virtually limitless. There's no material force that could cause a universe like that. There has to be an all-powerful, supernatural force that could bring such a universe into existence. You see, God is the best answer. Furthermore, we would expect the universe to be a jumbled mass that's got no design, no order if there wasn't a God. But instead, our universe is extremely complex. It's well-designed. It's a system made up of many different parts. The physical laws governing our universe show some type of brilliant lawgiver had to be behind their design. When we look at nature, we see complex plants, animals, insects. They all exhibit intelligent design. Therefore, we can correctly conclude that there is an intelligent cause of our universe, not a mindless, random process. In addition, the fact that humans are moral beings points to the existence of God. If humans had evolved from mud over millions of years, there'd be no explanation for morality. Rocks and dirt have no sense of right and wrong. Amoebas don't think it's unjust to steal. Worms have no sense of moral obligation. Yet humans do. The logical answer is that the supernatural, intelligent Creator endowed humans with a sense of morality. Now, where would God get morality? Someone might ask. Well, the simplest and best answer is that it comes from His very nature. He is good, He's true, and He's just. And everything He does or thinks is necessarily good and right. Goodness or rightness is godlike. Evil or wrong, it's against God's nature. When we look at all the evidence from our universe, we can see there must be a first cause, which is a supernatural, intelligent being who endowed humanity with a sense of morality. The most popular book in the world correctly recorded it when that book said, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Who is God? You know, people have asked that question for years. Who is God? Some people say that God's a life force that drives the world. Others, they say that God's a personal being. Still, others believe that the idea of God is made up by people who want to control people with something like religion. Who is God? Let's explore that question. When we think about humans, we think about their personality. This person is kind. That person is mean. This person is shy. What do we mean by personality? You see, there's something inside each person that does the thinking. It's the part of us that decides where to go, the part that determines what to say, how to act, who we are. Many people refer to that part of us as our spirit. You see, the human spirit couldn't have evolved over millions of years from nature. There's no natural process that can produce a spirit, a conscious mind. Humans must have received our spirit from somewhere other than nature. And that's where the concept of God fits in. Only a thinking being could create other beings who think. Only a spirit could create people with spirits or minds. Humans are made in the image of God. That means that they have a spirit, a personality like their creator. 
The Creator is a spirit. He's not a ghost or a transparent apparition, but He's the ultimate mind. He's the personality behind all creation. He's the mind who knows everything. While He doesn't have a physical body that we can see, He does have a personality and a mind that we can connect with. The picture of this personal God, it's found in the record of His loving Word. Through His Word, we can learn that God is a person who loves His created beings. He cares for humans. He wants them to achieve greatness. In fact, we learn that this eternal God is kind, He's merciful, He's forgiving, He's righteous, He's just. We also learn that He desires to form a relationship with each and every human that He creates. Since He made every person in His own image, He loves each person and He wants to be loved by them. Isn't it time you began to form a relationship with a person in your life who cares more about you than anyone else, your Creator? Where is God? We can go to a zoo, we can see all kinds of animals, we can use a telescope and see millions of stars and galaxies, we can use a microscope and see tiny cells and organisms. But what can we use to see God? Is He in space? If so, can we see Him with a telescope? Is He so small we need a microscope to see Him? Where's God? That's a great question. The answer, it's not as complicated as some may think. The best and most accurate information we have about God comes from His Word. God tells us that in one sense, He's everywhere. The inspired writer David once asked God, Where can I go from your Spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in the realm of the dead, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. The Scripture also says the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. So in one sense, God is everywhere. Since He's the Great Spirit, He doesn't have a physical body like humans have. He can be in all physical places at the very same time. Now, there's no way to run away from God or go someplace where God can't find us. And that's exciting because it means that there's no place that humans can go that would be too far away from God for Him to help us. In that sense, God's everywhere. In another sense, however, God is in heaven. Heaven is God's spiritual home. Heaven's not high on a mountain or deep in the ocean. It's not at the edge of outer space. In fact, it's not a physical place that we can touch, see, taste, hear, or smell in a regular sense with our physical senses. If we could look with spiritual glasses and see the spiritual world, we'd be able to see God in heaven right now. In God's Word, we read about a preacher named Stephen. He was being murdered for teaching about Jesus. He was being stoned. And he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. God was always there. It was just Stephen and the others couldn't see him. When God allowed Stephen to see the spiritual world, he could see God in heaven. So since God is spirit, he can be in every place in the physical world at one time. And He can also be in His spiritual home, heaven. It should be the goal of all people to live our lives in such a way that we get to live in God's spiritual home, heaven, with Him forever. How big is God? As humans, we're curious beings. Whether consciously or not, we constantly question the world around us. And why not? The world around us is filled with amazing creatures and fascinating places. What can we see? Where can we go? How can we explore farther, faster, deeper, and higher? How privileged we are in this creation to have so many resources at our disposal. You know, humanity now numbers over seven billion living souls. And we all exist together on this planet. We construct our cities together. We build our homes near each other. We share our personal lives together. In trying to understand the incredible depth of human relationships and the amazing scale of our universe, we are led back to this question. How big is God? This question really involves a relationship between God and us. 
First, we ask how big because of our sense of awe and how large God's creation really is, especially when compared to the scale of our everyday lives. As the focal point of God's creation, humanity physically occupies only a tiny enclave of space. Our planet orbits 93 million miles away from a star we call the sun, which is so large that over one million Earths could fit inside it. Yet the sun is, at the very most, a medium-sized star. The largest supergiant stars could hold three billion suns. That's over three quadrillion Earths. That's a three followed by 15 zeros. And if the sun was replaced by such a supergiant star, its size would consume the orbit of Mercury, of Venus, of Earth, of Mars, and even out past Jupiter. In addition, our entire solar system is but a speck in the sea of stars, possibly a hundred billion, that compose the sprawling spiral structure of our Milky Way galaxy. And even more incredible is the fact that despite our Milky Way galaxy being 100,000 light years in diameter, it's only a single, moderately sized galaxy in a universe that contains an estimated 100 billion other galaxies. And they are spaced so far apart that each one seems to be an island of stars in the sea of blackness. When we ask the question, how big is God? We use the word big because we understand all of these mind-boggling distances and sizes of objects must logically be the result of an even more astounding creator. And that is exactly how the Bible describes God's power. The prophet Jeremiah stated, He has made the earth by His power. He has established the world by His wisdom. And He has stretched out the heavens at His discretion. In addition, God's power, the Bible also tells us of His nature. The Apostle John wrote, God is spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote that He is the King eternal, immortal, invisible. These two verses clearly define God's nature as being spirit. And as such, He does not have a, a boundary or an size or extent. He's not contained within a star, a nebula, or even a galaxy. And even further, there are no physical objects or spatial sizes that can describe God in an accurate way. Despite their beauty, no nebula, no galaxy can compare to God. And even the universe in its immensity does not define God's nature. The Bible conveys this exact thought when it states in the book of Isaiah, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to Him? Being spirit, God is not contained within the universe's dimensions or measured by its physical units. Instead, He is eternal and is infinite. Yet here is the most humbling aspect. Even though God is awesome in His power and infinite in His nature, He still inhabits the smallest and quietest of places. You see, God will always be present in our lives if we obey His will. God Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Our aim should be that we can sincerely say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. What is God? You know, people talk about God all the time, but what is God really? Nobody's ever produced a picture of what He looks like. I mean, for that matter, how do you know God is a He? If we can't touch or see or hear God, how can we know what God is? The truth is the vast majority of humans have wondered what God is. You might be surprised to know that the answer is simpler than you think. God is a spirit. <laughs> yeah, I know you might be thinking, thanks a lot. That doesn't really help because I don't really know what a spirit is. Well, so what is a spirit? Most of us think about a spirit as like a ghost or a see-through apparition. But the concept of spirit is much simpler as well. A spirit is simply a mind. You see, all humans have a spirit, a mind. It's the part of you that does the thinking, the part that decides where to go, what to say, how to act. That's your spirit. Your spirit couldn't have evolved over millions of years from nature. No natural process can produce a spirit or a conscious mind. You received your spirit from God. And since this is true, it shows us this about God. Only a thinking being could create other beings that think. Only a spirit could create people
with spirits or minds. Humans are made in the image of God. They've got a spirit like their Creator. The Creator is a spirit. He's the ultimate mind. He's the personality behind all creation. He's the mind who knows everything. He's not a mindless life force. No, instead, He's a person who thinks and acts. His thoughts are more holy than humans and His motives are always right. But He is a mind, a person who has chosen to create other people to love and to form relationships with. Well, He doesn't have a physical body that we can see. He does have a personality and a mind that we can connect with. Homology or similarity in evolution. You know, for more than a hundred years, evolutionists have argued that similarities among living things prove that living things share a common ancestor. You know, because the flipper of a whale and the forefoot of a dog have certain likenesses, supposedly they share the same great, 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 great grandparents. Similarities between the wing of a bat and the forefoot of a turtle are supposedly proof of evolution. Because of DNA of the chimpanzee and humans and their similarity, 96-98% of the time, evolutionists declare we must have evolved from the same ape-like creature millions of years ago. You know, creationists don't deny that similarities exist. I'll tell you what creationists do, however. They do deny that similarities among living things prove evolution. In fact, similarities among living things fit perfectly with the creation viewpoint. This is exactly what we would expect among creatures that drink the same water, eat the same food, breathe the same air, live on the same land. Common features among living things make perfect sense if we all share a common creator. Humans and chimps both have eyes and tongues and noses and ears and feet and legs and hair. No doubt, then, our genetic makeup is going to be very similar. But even sea sponges, which scientists once thought would only have shared 1 or 2 percent of our DNA, actually share about 70 percent of our DNA. And believe it or not, the nematode worm actually shares about 75 percent of our DNA. Yet we obviously look nothing alike. Such similarities actually tell us something about the Creator's loving nature. Think about it. Human life is more valuable than all other life forms. But because God created a world where man can study, kill, experiment on, and look at non-human life forms like sea sponges and worms, humans can actually learn more about the human body without the taking of human life. Those who are created in the image of God. You see, similarities don't prove a common ancestor, but they show that there's a common designer. In short, even though you'll likely read about evolutionist similar things argument, in almost every textbook that addresses the theory of evolution, similarity does not prove evolution to be true. It's just another example of the evolutionist's faulty interpretation of the facts. Facts that creationists openly embrace and logically explain. Similarity points toward a common creator, not a common ancestor. Biomimicry. Now, what is that? Well, in the realm of technology and science, there's a field of study, and it's pretty popular these days. It's called biomimicry. The word biomimicry comes from two Greek words, bios meaning life, like biology, and mimesis meaning to imitate or to mimic. You see, therefore, biomimicry means the imitation of life. This field of study looks at certain things in nature and it attempts to use those designs and structures in nature to create technology that's helpful to humans. Now, the list of things included under the term biomimicry is very long. Recently, scientists have begun to develop a tiny flying robot that mimics a fly. Now, interestingly, it's about the same size and weight of a fat housefly. And they've come up with a lot of uses for this. Uh, they say this robo-fly could help firefighters locate people during fires or spy on potential terrorists. Now, why would anyone want to copy a fly? Well, the reason's really simple. 
flies are some of the most well-designed flyers in the world. Ron Fury, uh, the scientist behind a lot of the research on RoboFly, said that flies are the fighter jets of the animal kingdom. They can change speed and direction in a fraction of a second, and they can even land upside down. Just try catching one with your hand to see how great they are at flying, Dr. Fearing said. He also said there are all kinds of things nature can do that we don't know how to do yet. Dr. Fearing and many of the people who study biomimicry conclude that these wonderful designs and structures are the result of evolution. But that doesn't make any sense. If humans who are very intelligent have not been able to create designs and structures as efficient as those in nature, then how could evolution have done it by blind chance and accident? Doesn't it make much better sense to believe that God, the great designer of the universe, created the fighter jets of the animal kingdom with all their amazing designs? Isn't it amazing how God's design found in a common housefly is better than some of the technology found in our most advanced jet airplanes. The Apostle Paul had it right when he said, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see, the entire field of biomimicry proves that there is a designer in nature, and that designer is God. Gill slits and embryos. In 1860, there was a man by the name of Ernst Haeckel, and he believed in evolution. He was a German professor at the University of Jena. And during his years of teaching, he tried to convince his students that evolution is true. Now, to prove evolution was true, he came up with an idea that human embryos go through different evolutionary stages as they grow. According to Ernst Haeckel, a human embryo starts out in a one-celled stage, just as its ancient amoeba-like ancestor. And then he said it develops gill slits just like an ancient fish ancestor. And he said it has a tail just like an ancient ape-like ancestor. And therefore, suggested Dr. Haeckel, if we will just watch a human embryo grow, then we'll see the different stages of evolution. He used this phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Now, in order to prove this theory of his, he made several drawings of the different stages of different animals, a dog, a pig, a human, a chicken, a turtle, salamander. But when he published these drawings, other professors started looking at them and saying, hey, go, where'd you get these? When they started investigating further, it seemed that Dr. Haeckel had not only been inaccurate, but he'd been dishonest. You see, he was proven to be wrong in the 1880s. And his idea about humans going through their evolutionary family tree as embryos, it was shown to be completely false in the 1880s. And that should have been the end of the story. But it's not. In fact, it's not the end of the story at all. Even though Hegel's false theory and drawings were disproved almost 120 years ago, did you know that they are still being used today in many science books to prove evolution? Why are textbook writers still using these drawings that were faked and altered and falsified? You know, that is the real mystery here. On May 29th, 2010, I was speaking to a group of teenagers in Michigan about Ernst Haeckel and his false evidence, and I explained to them all about the textbook still using these things as evidence. And they said to me, one of them, about two weeks after my visit, a ninth grader sent me an email. And here's what that email said. This week in my biology class, we learned about the theory of evolution. During this segment, we had to do worksheets on evolution. Two of the main things we did were on the English peppered moths and similarity in embryos. Those are two things you proved false during your seminar. You taught us that those things were false but still put in textbooks and taught in schools today. I was both astonished and humored that these two false teachings showed up in my high school the week following your seminar. That's what the ninth grader said. You see, even though Haeckel's ideas were proven false, 
They're still used to teach evolution today. Why do you think that is? I'll tell you one reason. If you took out everything that we know to be false, that's used as evidence for evolution, you wouldn't have much left to teach evolution. Ernst Haeckel and similarity in embryos, we've known that idea is false for 120 years, and yet a bulk, the majority of science textbooks still use that as evidence to prove evolution. Well, I'll tell you what that is. That's evidence that doesn't prove anything other than that the theory of evolution is falling on hard times. Young Earth creation. Now, many people in the scientific community, they've bought into the concept of the Big Bang. And along with that, they've concluded that science teaches that the Earth is billions of years old. You know, many of these people suggest that it's ignorant to believe in anything other than the Big Bang. And they believe that any person who says that the Earth is only a few thousand years old must be an unscientific, uneducated person. Is it true? that those who believe that the universe was created by God only a few thousand years ago are ignorant and unscientific? Mm. The truth is, no. Science isn't on the side of the Big Bang. It's not on the side of the old Earth scenario. When all of the scientific information is considered, the concept of a young Earth fits the evidence much better. For instance, when scientists look at the decay rate of Earth's magnetic field, or the amount of sodium in the oceans, or the rate at which comets disintegrate, or the amount of helium and minerals. You know, old Earth scenarios just don't fit the data. Furthermore, the historic information found in the most accurate ancient book in the world agrees with the scientific data for a young Earth. If we were to ask if the concept of a young Earth is a scientific idea, we'd find that numerous highly educated scientists advocate a young Earth as the best explanation for the scientific data. Currently, I work with a man who has a Ph.D. in astrophysics from the University of Alabama, a NASA employee with a Ph.D. from MIT, a physicist with a Ph.D. from Auburn University. And all of these individuals conclude that the scientific evidence supports a young Earth. In the book, In Six Days, 50 scientists are on record who have doctor's degrees who contend that the scientific evidence points to the conclusion that an intelligent designer created the world in six literal 24-hour days. In fact, virtually every survey that's been done in the past several decades has shown that about 40% of all Americans believe that God created the universe in pretty much its present form about 10,000 years ago. Young Earth creation fits perfect with all of the available scientific and historic evidence. Young Earth creation is a scientific, an accurate, a right idea. Creation and peer-reviewed journals. You see, scientists who teach that an intelligent designer created the universe, they're often ridiculed by the evolutionary community. Now, this ridicule comes in many different forms, but one of the most often used tactics of the atheistic community is to claim that creation science is simply not good science. As evidence that creation or intelligent design is not good science, atheistic evolutionists exult in the fact that the standard peer-reviewed scientific journals don't publish papers that support intelligent design. One atheistic scientist put it this way, quote, most telling perhaps is intelligent design's near total failure to make any headway in the peer-reviewed publications that are the gateway to scientific success, end quote. The reasoning here is that if creation or intelligent design were scientific, then it would be included in peer-reviewed journals. But since it's not in peer-reviewed journals, then it must not be scientific. Now, let's look at the problem with this reasoning. The fact is this reasoning is a circular process by which papers are accepted for inclusion in such journals based on the absence of creation in those papers. 
The scientists in authoritative positions have established their own preconceived definition for science. Such scientists say this, to be scientific in our era is to search for solely natural explanations. Thus, if a paper even hints at something other than a natural explanation, it's rejected as unscientific, regardless of the facts or research that's presented in the paper. Creationist papers aren't rejected from peer-reviewed journals because they're not scientific. They're rejected because they don't give naturalistic explanations. You see, it's clear that the oft-repeated accusation against creation science's lack of peer-reviewed papers is seen for what it is, an intentional exclusion based not on the merits of the paper, but on the agreed upon but very false definition that true science entails only natural explanations. And the scientific establishment stance is similar to that of a child who forms an exclusive club. And one of the stipulations for membership being that all members must be extremely smart. The child then includes in the bylaws that all smart people should think that he, the founding member, is always right. Thus, he concludes that those who don't think he is always right are not smart. And then he proceeds to malign those not in the club based on the idea that they're not smart. And as proof that they're not smart, he says that obviously they're unintelligent because they're not members of his club. Circular reasoning at its finest. In reality, the motivation for castigating those outside his club is simply the fact that they disagree with him, which is the same motivation that propels the evolutionary establishment to reject all creation science articles. You're not going to find articles advocating intelligent design in the majority of peer-reviewed journals, not because the findings aren't scientific, but because they fail to provide evidence and proof of the conclusions as naturalistic. The truth is, many of the best articles ever written never make it into peer-reviewed journals because they mention creation and provide data to support that correct, accurate conclusion. You know, quite often, the Bible will make a very specific remark about a certain person or a place or a thing, and you can check that against historical and archaeological evidence. Such cases provide an excellent way to build up cooperative evidence in support of the Bible's accuracy and inspiration. The book of 2 Kings relates the story of King Hezekiah, one of the few kings of ancient Judah who did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. You see, this part of Scripture lists a number of his achievements. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he made a pool and a tunnel and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? We then read in 2 Chronicles that this same Hezekiah stopped the water outlet of Upper Jehon and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. These two passages provide us with a wonderful opportunity to verify the Old Testament's accuracy. You know, you would think that such a feat of aquatic engineering would leave behind some type of archaeological evidence. Well, is there any extra biblical information to verify this story? Can you go to Jerusalem and look under it and see a tunnel? <laughs> Indeed you can. Randall Price, in his fascinating book, The Stones Cry Out, catalogs amazing evidence to confirm the tunnel that Hezekiah dug underneath the city of Jerusalem. How Hezekiah carved this 1,750-foot tunnel through solid limestone, well, that still remains a mystery even today. But in 1880, an inscription, now known as the Siloam Inscription, was discovered that helped fill in some of these blanks. Apparently, Two crews of Hezekiah's men working with picks tunneled from opposite ends, snaking through the limestone in an S-shaped style. How these two crews met in the middle without the aid of modern compasses or other devices, still unknown. But the fact that Hezekiah built this tunnel leaves no mystery to uncover. Time and time again, the Bible checks out and remains the most accurate and authoritative book ever written.
The last few days of Jesus' life, they were the most tragic of any in human history. Ruthless men and women mocked Him, spit on Him, hit Him. And amidst all this violence, there stood one man who had the power to stop all the torture. One man who could call off the Roman soldiers and save Christ from being crucified. His name? Pontius Pilate. The Roman official who governed the area of Judea at the time of Christ's death. The story of the crucifixion can hardly be told without mentioning the name of this Roman official who sentenced Christ to death, even though Pilate knew he was innocent. But although the Bible mentions Pilate on several occasions, his name couldn't be found among the archaeological evidence. For hundreds of years, no stone inscriptions or other physical evidence could be produced to support the idea that a man named Pilate had anything to do with either Jesus or Judea. You know, because of this, many people mocked the Bible. They claimed that creative Bible writers concocted Pilate from their own fertile imaginations. I mean, after all, if Pilate were such a prominent leader, wouldn't there be some kind of archaeological evidence to verify his existence? Again, the critics were silenced in 1961 when an Italian archaeological team working at the city of Caesarea found a stone tablet. It measured about 32 inches high by 27 inches wide by about 8 inches thick. And on this stone slab, it's now known as the Pilate inscription, were the remains of this very simple title, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. Almost the exact same title as the one given to Pilate in Luke chapter 3, verse 1. This then became yet another find to remind us that the more we uncover the past, the more we uncover the truth. The Bible is indeed the Word of God. How long were Adam and Eve in the garden before they were sent out by God? You know, if you've read the book of Genesis, you've probably thought about this question, and it's actually a very important question. What if there were thousands of years before Adam and Eve were ejected? Well, that would certainly affect how we understand the Bible and what it says about the age of the earth and things of that nature. Is there a way to know how long Adam and Eve were in the garden? Well, actually, the answer is yes and no. No, the Bible doesn't give us an exact, specific time period that they were in the garden. We can't say that they were there for 12 years, 24 days, and 38 minutes. Now, that being said, the Bible does give us an upper limit as to how long they were there. In Genesis 1.14, we read that God created the lights of the sky, the sun, moon, stars, and then God stated, let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. So we can know that by day four, the sun, moon, and stars were marking the days. But even before that, we see in the creation account that it says that there was an evening and a morning day one, an evening and a morning day two. So days as we know them were being marked by an evening and a morning from the beginning of the first day of creation. And they were functioning throughout that week. Now Adam and Eve were created on day six of creation, and then they were placed in the Garden of Eden. At some point they sinned, and they were ejected from that garden. And then Eve gave birth to two sons, Cain and Abel, outside of the garden. Cain then killed Abel. After Abel's death, we read in Genesis 4.25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son named Seth. Now, let's get to the point. In Genesis 5.3, we read that Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. We then read, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. Since we know that days were being counted the first week of creation, and we know that all the days of Adam's life were 930 years, then we can know that he could not have been in the garden any longer than 930 years years. But when we consider that Seth was born after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, and Seth was born when Adam was 130 years old, then we know the longest possible amount of time for Adam and Eve to have been in the garden would be just shortly before at least 130 years. So the answer simply is that they could not have been in the garden any longer than 130 years. That helps us understand the rest of what the Bible says about the earth, the days of creation, and how long the earth has been around. What about Pangea and the Bible? 
If you've read much scientific writing about the Earth's geography, you've probably heard about this supercontinent called Pangaea. Scientists suggest to us that at one time in the past, all of the continents were joined together in one great landmass. The word Pangaea is composed of two words. Pan, meaning all, and Gaia, meaning land or earth. So the name simply means all land or all earth. What does the Bible say about this? In truth, the Bible doesn't really say anything specifically about Pangaea. But the text does seem to leave room for the idea to have been a reality sometime in the past. In Genesis 1-9, during the third day of creation, the text says, Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Now notice that the text says that the waters were gathered together in one place. You know, that seems to indicate that the earth was in one place as well, lending credit to the idea of Pangaea. Now some Bible readers then flip over to Genesis 10, 25, and they read this statement. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. That name Peleg means division, and they suggest that the earth here means the land. The continents were divided, and they think that this is a statement about Pangaea. Well, that's a slight possibility from the text. The text doesn't preclude that, but it probably is not the case. The Peleg reference is most likely talking about the division of languages at the Tower of Babel. You see, just eight verses after Peleg is mentioned, the text says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. There in Genesis 11.1. Notice that the word earth, there in Genesis 11.1, is talking about the people. So Peleg was most likely alive when God confused all the languages that were scattering the people, the whole earth, around the globe. So what then about Pangaea? If there was a huge supercontinent, then the flood of Noah's day most likely disrupted it. Now, the problem with the way that Pangaea is generally presented in scientific readings and writings is that supposedly this took millions and millions of years using the idea of uniformitarianism. That idea that we can measure how fast continents are moving away from each other now and we can extrapolate back using that same rate. The problem with this uniformitarianism idea is that it doesn't account for the flood. If a huge global flood that broke up the foundations of the deep all over the earth actually did occur then that would be a good answer as to how those continents could have broken up. So the idea of Pangaea, it certainly could fit into the Bible, but those millions of years of uniformitarian time, well, they simply don't. So one aspect of the idea that you'll read in scientific writings about Pangaea, that all the continents were in one place at one time in the past, probably true. The idea that it was millions and millions of years ago, not true because it's based on uniformitarian assumptions. Do a quick search of YouTube for best atheistic arguments, and you'll get several videos that include popular atheists saying this in a nutshell, well, I just believe in one less God than you do. What do they mean by that? Well, they rattle off a list of gods such as Zeus, Poseidon, Vishnu, Buddha, Horus, Apollo, and then they say something to the effect of, tell me why you don't believe in those gods, and I will use your very same reasons to tell you why I don't believe in your god. The problem with this is it's not an argument at all. It's a neat little play on words, but when you look at it closely, it's not logical reasoning or it's not an argument for anything. The idea is just that because there are many wrong answers, then all the answers have to be wrong. In fact, the statement implies that this one less answer is just the next step in the sequence. But hold on. If there is actually just one correct answer, then of course all the other answers would be incorrect. For instance, if a person were to say, you don't believe that 2 plus 2 equals 5, or 6, or 7, or 9, therefore 2 plus 2 doesn't have an answer. 
See, I just believe in one less answer than you do. I think you see the problem. If there is a singular answer for, then the one less statement leaves out the most important answer. Now let's look at it from another angle. When Thomas Edison was inventing the light bulb, the story is told that he said that after trying 10,000 different filaments, he hadn't failed, he just found 10,000 things that didn't work in a light bulb. Now, suppose a person were to say, tell me why those 10,000 filaments didn't work, and I'll use the same reasoning to tell you why the one thing you say works won't. I just believe in one less filament than you. Well, again, I think you can see the problem. The characteristics of the filaments that don't work are obviously very different from the ones that do. Yes, it may be true that atheists believe in one less God than the God of the Bible. But the fact is, no other God is the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good creator of life who came down to earth in human form and sacrificed himself for his human creatures simply because he chose to of his own free will. Yes, atheists believe in one less God, but it is that God and only that God who truly fits all the criteria to be the singularly correct answer. If the Bible is true and God created only two humans, Adam and Eve, then how did we get so many different races all over the world? That's an excellent question. First, since we're looking at this from a biblical historical perspective, we need to nail down the fact that Adam and Eve were responsible for populating the entire globe. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, we read, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, certainly she wasn't the mother of all living creatures. This verse simply means she was the mother of all living humans. God didn't create other sets of humans and place them in other positions throughout the earth. As Acts chapter 17, verse 26 says, God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the earth. Adam and Eve were the first two and the only two humans created to populate the earth. Now, second, we need to look at this idea of race. What do we mean by different races? You know, generally we lump people into races based on characteristics, races like Oriental or Caucasian or Hispanic. But what do those terms really mean? They're simply loose categories of people that have certain similar traits. But what kind of similar traits do we use for these categories? We find that it's just arbitrary. We just make up our own list. For instance, suppose we were to take the trait of skin color or pigment. The pigment melanin is responsible for skin color. More melanin means a darker skin. Less melanin means a lighter skin. But even using skin color to determine a race is problematic. For instance, many people from Africa have dark skin, but so do those from India. Yet we don't generally put those two groups into the same race category. Again, Native Americans and Hispanics generally have similar amounts of melanin, yet we don't often categorize them as similar or the same race. So what we see then is that there's no clear-cut line as to what a race actually is. It's an arbitrary term we've created to define a group of people with certain traits, but lots of times it doesn't work. In fact, some researchers say that the term race is so meaningless that it ought to be discarded. But what we see is that people in one race will many times have characteristics from people that we would say are in another race. In truth, there really is only one race, the human race. But let's answer the question. How could we get so much physical variety in hair color, skin color, height, facial features, etc. from one original couple? The simple answer is, if the original couple had the proper genetic makeup, then they could easily have produced all the variations that we see today. Since melanin is controlled by genes, we can discuss them as sets of dominant 
and recessive genes. And we can note them as capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. Capital A, capital B are dominant traits, and lowercase a and lowercase b are recessive traits. The book Creation, Facts of Life, notes that if Adam and Eve were both capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B, they would have been extremely dark and all of their offspring would have been dark. If, on the other hand, they were lowercase a, lowercase a, lowercase b, lowercase b, then the opposite would be the case and they would have been very light-skinned as would all of their descendants. However, if they were both heterozygous and were capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b, they were an original middle brown in skin color, then in reality in a single generation, if they had had 16 children, we would expect them based on probability to be one, extremely dark, four, dark, six, medium, middle brown, four, light, and one, very, very light. Did you know still today we can see such variety in certain families across the globe? So if Adam and Eve's offspring paired together, the variation would continue until light groups and dark groups got together and lost the genetic information to produce the variety in color, locking in what we might call a race. Scientifically speaking, then, it would be rather easy to get all the variation that we see today from an original pair of humans that were genetically diverse. Adam and Eve are all we need.